The model is predicting $1 million in four years. You can measure how much Bitcoin is enough to retire. One interesting way to do it is when you divide total Bitcoin by the number of millionaires in the world. This gets you to 0 0.36 Bitcoin. Paola tells us that Bitcoin right now is growing at a 46% annual rate. Whatever liquid investment that I have, I put it in Bitcoin. And that's my only game. And it actually has made my life very, very easy. Whenever you have a lot of leverage building up in the derivatives pretty soon we will have a crash in bitcoin until all the leverage is cleared up and whenever derivatives goes really really short especially with leverage bitcoin pumps significantly the top of the next bubble should be somewhere around 300k when we look at all the data it seems like waiting now one year to buy bitcoin is a terrible terrible <laughs> idea understanding economics is not even an option it's a must for everyone to have a better life and on not understanding economics is gonna have devastating consequences if you aren't a socialist under 20 you don't have a heart but if you're still a socialist over 20 you're an idiot <laughs> It's uh, it's it's Bitcoin power law time. <laughs> I, I call it like that. Power uh, law season. Are, power law what? Power law season because it's getting more and more popular. Oh, power law season. Yeah, it's getting really uh, a lot more power uh, <laughs> powerful, a lot more uh, popular. Um, you are my fifth guest actually on 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 the show. Um, you probably know Fred that was on the show. You probably know uh, Stephen, uh, and you probably know uh, Giovanni, of course. Uh, he was the first one to introduce me and it was like a two and a half hour episode. And I was like, what is that? <laughs> when, when Giovanni introduced it to me, I had no idea about it at all. And now I slowly, slowly uh, begin to grasp it a little bit. Uh, I'm no expert at all. And I had uh, Adrian Morris on. Uh, he was a little bit more critical and he raised some points. Uh, and yeah, it was was interesting to hear some so, some of the other side also. Um, but yeah, uh, let's let's first start with like uh, why why do you want why do you like the power law and and what is it good for for the people that uh, don't know about it at all? Yeah, so I am a you know I'm a, pro a professional data analyst. So uh, the reason I like power law is that it's done correctly. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's a lot of bad models um, in this space. Like, for example, when Plan B came up with this model, I didn't even it didn't even attract me enough to for me to kind of even replicate his work. Uh, even though, like I said, I do this for a living every day. I analyze financial data, um, but this model is uh, done correctly, but again doesn't mean that it can give us like superpowers to predict the future uh, it just means the math is correct and that just gave me the uh, and there's also a very interesting theory behind it um, a lot of the times problems happen when people find correlations and they find two lines that happen to work together, move together, and they think, okay, now we found something that can predict um, the other variable. And they rely too much on it, and they kind of believe it too much, and they even try to trade with it. And that becomes um, a, a rude awakening pretty soon. And uh, But because of that, just having a... Well, a, a fitting line, a well-fitting line is not enough. So even though, again, with the power law model, the fit is okay, uh, actually pretty good, um, it's not enough. We need a theory behind what's going on as well. So uh, power law includes extra things that gives us more assurance. For example, it can explain why do we see that very, very... Um, uh, good looking char uh, good looking growth following a very simple mathematical relationship the reason for that is you can trace back the growth of price to growth of uh, Bitcoin network so within the math you can also include the adoption and number of addresses as a proxy for Bitcoin adoption and you see that it kind of begins explaining the Bitcoin's price growth using uh, based on something like the Metcalf law. So uh, there is, I guess there is 
a lot of explanations as well for why we see that that model. So that gives me, uh, you know, a lot more confidence to to really focus on this model and uh, and explore it further, because the math is correct, and there is we also understand a lot better why we see that shape and that growth. So it's um, more of understanding how Bitcoin grows and not a trading tool. Yes, um, <clears throat> very important to understand what the hell is happening because like I said, a lot of times people just say, okay, these things are moving together, so I have an indicator. Uh, the main thing I wanna understand is why. You know, why is variable Y, variable X connected to variable Y? Uh, can I understand the mechanism that links these two? And if I understand it, I can make the claim that one is causing the other. If that's if you pass all these tests, then you can say X is predicting Y. Otherwise, you're just playing with uh, with fire because correlations uh, don't always last, but causal relationships do. Um, so if you uh, if you do the analysis right and you figure out something that's really causing the other thing, that's the only time you can use it for some level of prediction and even then it's all prob probabilistic right it's all probabilities you can never have very high you can never have very very high uh predictions but you can say something like 80 percent likely that this is going to happen and you have to have a plan for the 20 percent that this doesn't happen interesting i want to start with something uh, that i just thought about now um I had, I remember two or three points that uh, Adrian Morris brought up that uh, kind of made sense for me that I just want to uh, get in here and we maybe can talk about it. He said one thing that he's like, if it's a tool that not just tries to the, to, to see why in the past uh, Bitcoin is growing that much, but also maybe a future tool where we're like, okay, around like 2030, 2035, we should be there, like a little bit of a prediction tool. Um, his his point was like the 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 bandwidth uh, and the range of of that is is very very broad. And I hear that a lot in in discussion where like, oh, but the power law doesn't really say something because those those bandwidths those multiples um, are, are too broad. It, it's interesting for me because like, of obviously like you have always have like a, a bandwidth and and and, and uh, uh, some some uh, tolerance in that. Uh, and as I understand it from you, it's, it's not a, a prediction, a trading tool. Otherwise, like uh, then it's, it's anyways like not like that. But is, is wh why are those bandwidths so so broad? And uh, is it also like are there like um, uh, how should I say? Is there like um, predictions of like okay, the the outer bandwidth you can basically outsource because we don't really need that? Like is there like should we only focus on the, on the inner bandwidth or like how does this how does this work? Yeah, so uh, listen, power law is um, fundamentally a regression line. Um, a regression curve or line is, uh, it is, it looks like a line, but it's, but there's no actual line in there. It's all probabilities. So the line you see is only the average that's predicted but there is a whole amount of probabilities around it. And if, if it's following, a, if it's based on a normal distribution, actually the maximum and minimum is endless. So, <laughs> so it can go super high or super low, but the probability is like ignorable, right? So typically we think the maximum or minimum is uh, three standard deviations on the upside and three standard deviations to the downside. After that, the probability is very low. So we just assume, or we just cut it off. But um, technically anything is possible, right? Now in the power law, uh, the ups and downs are about 50%. So if it's if it if the model is kind of predicting, projecting uh, $1 million in four years, um, it's, actually more you have to think in probabilities it, it it's it's some kind of a range between half a million to two million dollars um uh, but you know it's not a small i i understand it's a big range but it's also not huge because you're predicting four years from now i mean it's it's crazy to even have something like this um 50 error on each side is 
I, I guess I can take it for the next five years, but also I don't really, you know, do anything with this uh, in terms of like, I don't count on the exact number uh, on the exact level that the price would reach. And then I open a trade based on it. No, it's uh, first and foremost, a tool to build conviction, a tool to understand the pattern. Right. And then there are, there are also some things that Powerlot doesn't explain. It doesn't explain the bubbles. It explains the average growth. I mean, you have to understand the concept of an average. Average actually may never happen. Average happens perhaps like once a year. But most of the time, Bitcoin is either in a bubble or is in, is in a you know, bloodbath below the, <laughs> below the average. So um, uh, bubbles will create a lot of deviation to the upside and then they might burst and the price crashes back down to the average and then quickly passes the average because at that point, people, everybody's like depressed. So they sell a, li a little bit more than what they should, right? And and the price goes uh, below it. But the average is still good to know because it gives you a, what I really like to call it a fair value concept, right? It gives you some place to, 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 to base your expectations off of, but you also have to consider everything is possible, right? There's a lot of volatility in Bitcoin. So um, just to answer your question, I guess I'd summarize it like this. Five years from now, uh, $1 million of error in prediction is fine. Uh, it's, it's not a small, but there's nothing, there's no financial data that you can predict five years from now with that uh, accuracy. So it's, that's not the problem. Actually, the problem that you should focus on is whether we, we should even try to project this regression model into the future. Um, because it is created based on historical data. What makes you think that you can project it into the future and, uh, rely on, on at least the average numbers that it gives you. Uh, and I can quickly again go back to my my previous point that uh, that's why I if you show me a perfect line on a data set I will never project it into the future right because I don't know if you've done it correctly to capture the main processes in the data okay in the data set there is systematic things that happen like the real stuff there's also noise. Right. So, and I don't know if your model is capturing the systematic behavior or the noise. If it's capturing the noise, uh, you're just explaining some things about the past, which will never repeat exactly the same in the future. If it's capturing the systematic relationship, you are, you are, uh, you have a model that, uh, you know, captures the most important the, the important forces in a system that will continue to happen in the future as well okay now uh we need a lot of good regression work and also good theory and good m analysis of mechanism behind it to be slightly more confident that we are capturing the systematic part not the noise part okay now, uh, there's a lot of tests you can do with data analysis to test the model in terms of whether it's capturing noise or not. Uh, one of them is cross-validation. And if I did that on, on both, say, Plan B's model and Power Law model, uh, and, and even if you go back in time and use the data up until 2020 or 2019, you see that Power Law will keep its accuracy. Uh, Plan B fails that test. Essentially... Uh, the, what we do in that test is we just keep some of the data out of the axis of the model. So you train the model on some of the data and you test, test it on the rest of the data. So at least you have some real uh, unused data to check the results against. And you could see that plan B models would fail. And that tells me that the model actually has, a. if you look at the plan B's model, it has a great fit. Uh, the R score is like 94, 95%. It's, it seems amazing, but if you run the proper tests, you will see that it fails to extrapolate into the future. So the parallel model passes this test uh, to very, to simplify it again, or actually kind of repeat, repeat it in a way that's much easier to capture. Um, 
if you ran power law in 2016 and used the model to predict today um seven uh, uh eight years later today it will give you very similar numbers like with ten twenty thousand dollars difference we would still be here and i had a tweet that kind of shows uh what, what would happen under different uh scenarios um what does that tell me that tells me whatever it was capturing in 2016 was strong and reliable enough that kept happening eight years after that so it was capturing something real in bitcoin's growth pattern what is that real thing uh, again perhaps we can talk about that uh, in the second part but i'll just give you a brief overview um, you understand what's going on a little bit better if you look at addresses okay when you look at addresses addresses are growing um, as a cube of time so it's a multiplier of third power of time and uh, this is a lot like this is a lot like virus growth right because the problem the thing is if you have one person it's going to take him a long time to convince the second person like satoshi was uh converting um hal finney difficult but if you have a hundred people maybe the next person is easy to convert maybe you can quickly have five other people join the network if you have a million people um then you see your new people automatically join it right so it gets faster and faster as as the network growth grows and if you follow the growth of addresses you see the same pattern over time and it makes total sense as the network gets bigger it brings in new people faster and faster and you can actually you know use a mathematical relationship that with reasonable level of accuracy shows this pattern and it makes total sense so it passes the math test it passes the logic test because you see in the data that adoption acts accelerates in the sense that as the network grows the number of new people that join also grow so and it's very you know you can think about larry fink from blackrock right a few years back we had a small community bitcoin wasn't <clears throat> wasn't wasn't as big as influential as it is and so blackrock was calling it the index of money laundering several years later bitcoin is bigger so many more people are in it it's more reliable and now larry fink is a uh, one of the biggest proponents and supporters of it uh, so you see this prior strength brings in new participants and new participants imp increase the power of the network to bring in yet newer participants that's why we say everyone will get into bitcoin just at the price they deserve right <laughs> so um and uh, you see this pattern exactly in the data and then you see okay should i expect the adoption how should i expect adoption to relate to price that one is also a very clear mathematical relationship uh, price of bitcoin is very interestingly highly associated with number of addresses and again as i say this there are there are people who will be typing in the comments Oh, number of addresses doesn't mean adoption. There are people who have many addresses and there are many addresses that are only, uh, and, and there are like an exchange that might be showing you one address, but that represents so many other people, right? That's correct. But still number of addresses is a rough measure of adoption. Like if you have many more people, you expect to have many more addresses, uh, considering all those noise, um, noises that can happen because of the lack of one-to-one -one relationship but overall the number goes up so you can use it as a rough measure um, and if you use that as a predictor of price number of addresses also predicts it uh, and it's it's a it's a re, it's a multiplier of second power 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 of two of the addresses so you take the addresses raise it to the power of two and with a multiplier that will model price very well. And that power of two is exactly what Robert Metcalf predicted communications networks would do. Like he said that in a communication network, 
the value of the whole network is a function of a square of number of people who are in the network. Why? Because if you have a telephone, one telephone, it's worth zero because there's nobody else to talk to. If a second person is in the network, now my telephone is significantly more valuable. If instead of two, there are 10 people in the network, it's much more valuable now, right? So, um, and Metcalf said it's a, the overall value is a function of the square of the number of members. And again, we said, see that in, in, in Bitcoin as well. So there is a very interesting explanation for why we see that regression line fitting very well in Bitcoin. All of this stuff that I explained in the past few minutes is makes it a lot more interesting than a, a coincidental line that somebody throws on the chart like a technical analysis, right? And that gives us a little bit confidence that this pattern will continue into the future. Like if you think that Bitcoin has been bringing in 50 million people every year into its network, I mean, it's very reasonable to assume that that number will only go, uh, will, will continue and only go higher in the future. But exactly how much higher, probably you can debate it. But uh, it, the pattern has stayed the same for the last decade or so. And it's only reasonable, reasonable to assume that it will continue, at least as your base case, it will continue to do the same in the near future. I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to say like 10 years from now, it's too much. I mean, I, even if you have the best model, that's, that's just too much. Like Mike, Michael Saylor was predicting up until 2040, right? <laughs> so that, that's like, you know, uh, that's a lot. Uh, but in the, you know, five year, four year, that's reliable. A network that's this big, it's not going to change its behavior overnight. It's interesting uh, because I think uh, <laughs> when we talk about price predictions, it's always interesting. Uh, I, I get a lot of data of like putting titles, thumbnails, and, and putting uh, videos out there from different people having different price predictions on different time zones. And this is always the, the one thing I get when I make um, something with price or adoption predictions within like 20 years from now, I always get those comments like, oh, like <laughs> that's too far away from me. Like uh, I will be dead then. <laughs> what do I have in 20 years from now? So I think the the, the short terms are uh, or short term, like medium terms, four or five years is not that short term, uh, are way more interesting for people, uh, at least what I saw uh, anyways. But it's interesting that the power law, um, was so predictable over the last eight or what's it, what did you say, 10 years uh, around that time because a lot of things have completely changed in, in Bitcoin fundamentally. Like we have now El Salvador as a country, we have the ETFs with BlackRock, we have uh, Michael Saylor with MicroStrategy and so many other companies that follow him. So like 10 years ago, <laughs> Bitcoin looked very different to, to what it is now. Uh, but you're saying like even eight years ago, if you would do done it in 2016, you would have came to kind of that 60,000, 80,000 price range that we have now. And from that, I think uh, what you said, four years between 500K and 2 million, uh, something like that you you said, um, that that's really yeah. uh, impressive to see that level of accuracy, accuracy, accuracy. Uh, but yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's interesting. Like, uh, when we move that out and then there's 1 million in, 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 in five years, that's, a uh, that gives, I think a lot of people, a lot of, uh, conviction also, like it's a conviction builder, uh, as you said, I, I like that way of thinking and, and comparing it to the past. Yeah. And that's something I also, um, we should give credit to Fred Krueger. He, he was the one that always would say, you know, I, I'm using this whole thing as a conviction builder. Um, you know, it, it's good to think like that. But unfortunately, most people will think in terms of, hey, I'm going to just predict next year and then uh, open up a, an options trade based on it. So if you've, you're saying it's better to like, okay, um, I have now my portfolio and based on the power of Bitcoin will maybe or like likely go to around 1 million in the next five years. And then I can make a more educated 
guess on uh, how much of my wealth should be in, in Bitcoin and what's my risk appetite and stuff like that. And you also said that I think in, in the in the beginning where I think Stephen it was, where you said like how much of my wealth uh, should be in Bitcoin and, and you had some math around that. Um, uh, can, can you, may, maybe you can quickly summarize it like, how does that work? Uh, if, 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 if it's like how much, uh, there's a lot of, uh, interesting debates in the Bitcoin community, like how many Bitcoin should I get to? Like what, what, what is the amount of, of Bitcoin I, I, I really want to have? Uh, should I be a 0 0.21? Should it be one Bitcoin? Yeah. Um, that's a great question. Whenever I hear someone saying, you know, you need one, you need two, you need three and 0.16, you need 6.15. Um, some of, I mean, most of the time it's just random stuff people say, so totally ignore that. Some other times there's some analysis behind it. For example, uh, one interesting way to do it is when you divide, uh, a total Bitcoin by the number of billion, a uh, number of millionaires in the world. I forgot the exact number of millionaires, but if you divide it, you'll see that there's just a few Bitcoin that, uh, all these millionaires in the world could have. If you can quickly uh, look at it, look it up. Uh, I don't know if it's six or 10. And then that was a good rule of thumb to say, okay, this is the millionaire. This is the future millionaire level. Uh, inflation adjusted. Um, and that's a, that's a good idea. Now, um, another thing you can do is, you know, have financial, personal financial planning like TradFi would do. What they do in TradFi is they look at, hey, you have some money in stocks. They have some money in bonds. This is how they're going to grow in the next few years. And if you want your profit to be enough to, to live comfortably, this is how much you need to invest. And you can do the same thing in Bitcoin. And now that we have a model that we can use as a base case, one of the benefits of it, it, it gives you a reliable base case, right? A base case, again, doesn't mean you bet your life on it, right? So you just understand that this is the most likely number. And there are other numbers that are possible. But if you have to begin with something, that's it. So Power Law tells us that Bitcoin right now, if you look at the shape of the curve, right now it's growing at a 46% annual rate. Okay. And that rate is going down um, slowly because, hey, you get in later, of course. You should. You'll you'll experience less of the benefits, but forty six percent, and it's going to go down to you know little by little every year. You exactly can measure these percentages of growth, so you can have a really good guess of how much your wealth will grow by the time you retire, and that's something actually we should do. I guess we should run the numbers exactly. Uh, and uh, compute some of these things to see for different people how much Bitcoin is needed for whatever income they're looking for. So if you want to live really comfortably, well, perhaps better to invest a lot more in Bitcoin right now and do harder and work harder and uh, accumulate. And then we can exactly compute what your total wealth will be if it follows the historical pattern. As a, again, as a base case, but then you can also play with <clears throat> some bad, uh, worst case, you know, best case scenarios and see, okay, if only half, half of what I thought materializes, what's going to happen? And even better, and even then, we're not going to say just half of half um, randomly. We can even put a probability on it. Like it's 60% likely that uh, you will. Uh, you will get more than half of the base case, right? So that's a good number to know to kind of build your uh, life on or build your plans on. If you want to be 90% safe, you probably bet on a much, much lower Bitcoin level, right? But but you can do all of those. I don't want to get into the weeds. Uh, with that, you can, <clears throat> you can measure how much Bitcoin is enough to retire. Okay, so that's something I really love to do. APSK is, a, is an... Is a friend, Twitter friend of mine who has begun like doing a lot of cool work here, but uh, there's tons of potential. And uh, 
perhaps in the next few weeks or months, I'll do some some uh, analysis on these things and put out some useful content for people. Uh, really cool. By the way, I looked it up. There are like 58 millionaires, apparently, at least in the world. Uh, so that would, if you divide 21 million by 58, this gets you to 0 0.36 uh, Bitcoin. So that's that's, an, that's a number. <laughs> three, three Bitcoin or 0 0.3? A 0 0.3, 0 0.3. Point three, yeah. So less less than one. Right? So most millionaires in the world uh, will not be able to have a full Bitcoin if they all wanted to buy it, right? So if you have more than point three, you are more than the future millionaire, right? And million, I I mean, uh, with the value today, right? I don't mean one million is going to be nothing in future, but think in terms of the importance of it today. Which is still not a whole lot, but <laughs> but um, so if you have one, one is great. One is like very safe, but doesn't mean you know uh, doesn't mean you should. I mean, it's just a logical thing to do to to save as much as possible and store your value in Bitcoin as much as possible. Worst case, it's gonna grow handsomely better than stocks best case it's going to grow much faster than stocks so there's nothing i mean it's very hard to make a case for any other investment <clears throat> yeah it's a, that, that's the interesting thing um like i have such a high conviction in bitcoin that i don't really need a power law in Oscar, a conviction builder even though it's really fun to talk about future price predictions but I'm anyways all in, like anyways, I don't have any other investments at all. So um, it's it's fun to think about that. And it motivates me maybe to, to work really hard right now and, and not to, to be lazy. Yeah. Uh, but in general, like, I, like so I'm So let me tell in, you but... something. Yeah, I was 100% invested. 100%, I mean 100% of liquid because, you know, you have house and things like that. Uh, 100% in Bitcoin before power law. I'm still 100% in Bitcoin after power law. Uh, but sometimes things happen like you get wages, you get wage, right? I'm, I'm a wage slave. So um, you get more or less cash available here and there. But typically for the many, many years, uh, not this year, but the years before, I've always operated at the like minimum bank account cash. Because I just hate to see any money that's in there. I feel like <clears throat> it's being stolen through inflation, right? So um, I, I was just funneling everything into Bitcoin. And that's how I think about model. I mean, I do the a lot of this modeling, but also for my personal planning. Uh, I don't kind of say that, hey, you know, let's let's just trade around it. You know, it's very difficult to... Because I understand there is a, also a chance that your model is wrong. You know, any if you have the best model in the world, you should still think. You know, there's a good chance that you know things just, or maybe your model is right. You know, some unknown event happens, so you have to be always planning for your plan, not going according to the plan, right? So that's important. Um, but nevertheless, when you when you analyze your when you analyze the uh, fundamentals of Bitcoin versus many other assets, as much as you can, whatever liquid um, liquid investment that I have, I I put it in Bitcoin, and and that's my only game. And it actually has made my life very very easy because um, I don't have to kind of be a hedge fund comparing the future stock performance of uber against lyft uh, and google against uh, amazon i'm a business professor so i like to do this but even then i don't have much time to analyze all these things and they change over time and you know how much time is wasted of average people trying to guess financial results of various companies and so you, you spend a lot of time doing it. And most of the time, you, you're also not successful outperforming the market. So this is a massive cost and no one talks about it. No one talks about it. Like the, the cost of forcing people to have to invest like a hedge fund, like an asset allocator. But 
Bitcoin allows me to just forget about all of it and just look at it as as you know as as if you're watching a burning house. People are running around, and we are on the other side of the street, comfortably, knowing that uh, we have a simple, simple solution that will kill them all and outperform them all. Yeah, it's it's uh, it's really fascinating. You you um, talked about Sailor uh, briefly. Um, I remember, I think I saw one or two tweets about that. That the base <laughs> case of Michael Saylor is actually really close to the base case of of the power law like th those models are not uh completely um far off uh, is is that true or i i just remember one one tweet in, in the back of my mind where that i saw that yeah so this is what michael saylor does he looks at the current rate of growth which is 46 percent and because the power law model also models it properly on the current on the on the existing data it also gives us the same number for today so power so sailor's base model starts from the correct number that's good uh, but because they have an exponential model it's not a power law model it's ex exponential exponential moves too fast because <clears throat> it doubles every uh so many years and if you do that doubling you see you quickly you know, capture the whole world's wealth and even beyond it. So there's no money, you know, there. So exponential just doesn't explain the model very well, the, the price action very well. So he continues from the correct starting point with an exponential. Exponential grows too fast. And Saylor has, he's a smart man. He realizes there is a problem here. So he, he knows that Bitcoin cannot keep growing 46 percent year after year because that's going to compound and capture the whole world immediately uh, very soon i mean um and actually some of his bull cases exceed the total wealth in the world so that's automatically invalidated but to fix that he realizes that the 40 percent every year should go lower next year lower next year no lower next year and by doing that he adjusts his exponential model to to slowly uh, to to get some kind of slower so that it matches a power law growth pattern it's not exactly the same but it's very similar actually so for some reason i mean his base case ended up predicting very similar number to the numbers to the power law which you know i take it if you like michael saylor those are the almost correct numbers so the base is good but the bear and bull are uh, just amazingly uh, different, and they are too low and too high, essentially covering uh, every single thing that can happen. Um, so, you know, it, it those could never be wrong because price will always be somewhere between the his bear case and bull case. If you watch my podcast already for more than two times, you know how extremely passionate I am about self-custody. And the first very, very, very important step to self-custody is always getting yourself a hardware wallet. And I have one for you here. This is the Bitcoin only edition from the Bitbox, my favorite single signature hardware wallet on the market. Another really important piece of self-custody if you have a hardware wallet is the backup of the seed phrase. And Bitbox made the perfect solution to back up your seed phrase. They made a reusable steel wallet. Check out that beauty. It's durable and extremely heavy. If I I put it on the desk I seriously fear for my own table it's so so heavy and durable I love it this is where my seed phrase is secure go to bitbox.swiss slash robin to get your bitbox and if you use code robin you even get 5% off of your complete order and the next step is to really level up your sovereignty as an individual 
You have to have the most secure self-custody setup. You have to secure your own devices. You have to protect your privacy. You have to set up an inheritance plan. And depending on where you live, you even want to have a plan B, a citizenship where you can move in case something goes really, really wrong. And through all those steps, the Bitcoin way is guiding you through step by step. And if you visit the bitcoinway.com slash partners slash Robin, you even get a 30 minute free call to find out how you can level up your sovereignty. And last but not least, I have something completely new for you guys. I partnered up with Coin Vigilante. This is the most beautiful Bitcoin timepiece that I ever saw created by anyone. Look at that beauty. I love it so much. Coin Vigilante made a and perfect Bitcoin watch. That's the perfect, subtle, elegant way to go out there and show that you are a Bitcoiner. And that watch brand is Bitcoin only. And Coin Vigilante just dropped a completely new and amazing Genesis edition of their watch collections. You have the date of the first ever mined Bitcoin block in there. And of course, also the block height and which epoch we are currently in. I love the level of detail they put in in this masterpiece. And make sure to check out those amazing Coin Vigilante timepieces down in the descriptions. I love those watches so, so much. Yeah, you talked about uh, 50% that uh, the, the power loss says between like the 1 million and uh, the 500,000 and the 1 million to 2 million. Uh, Mike, uh, what, what would that be in, what was the date from Michael Sale? I think 2045, I think he, he, yeah, he, he put it out. That half, that range will be 15x in Michael Saylor's model. So the difference between his bull and bear is 15x. But think about it, like in 2045, 15x is like 15 times the real est global real estate market. <laughs> so that's that's, <laughs> that's like, uh, like even more than, like I said, much more than the global wealth is in the error term. I mean, that's just too much, uh, too much to be useful even. You know, there are, we don't expect the models to be extremely accurate, right? We just want them to give us directional guide. But... This is like, um, I guess, I don't know how to think about it. Like, it's just, you can think of it as the maximum and minimum, not not anything more. It's just a, all the things that can happen is covered <laughs> in here. Yeah, it's a little bit like yours. Uh, you, you would say like, oh yeah, tomorrow it, it can be uh, 12 degrees, but it could also be 40. <laughs> yeah. So say, l l think about it this way. Like if I'm predicting the size of the global real estate market in 2045, I'm fine if I'm wrong by a factor of two, but if it's wrong by a factor of 10 or 15, it's probably not helpful for decision-making because that's going to change changed you know some of my strategies significantly let's talk about something that you brought up before uh, you saw it, i wrote it down the bitcoin cycle uh, with the volatility adjustment that paula uh, that that seems to be very interesting also with with the cycle impacts on on bitcoin before we get into that do you think that those cycles that we have now are always uh, oh. continuing because like the impact of it with lower and lower inflation that Bitcoin has, uh, with the um, with the block rewards diminishing, um, that, that the, the cycle, the four year cycle, should not have as a big of an impact as it had like uh, the the past few uh, cycles. How do you think in general of the impact of the halving and those four year cycles in Bitcoin? And then we can get into uh, the the charts that you have. Yeah. So uh, that's a great question as well. Cycles. Um, let's let's think about what happens to a cycle, right? Uh, what happened when we see a cycle or a bubble? Uh, this these things are studied in uh, other financial markets um, quite a bit, not not a whole lot, but in a significant way um, because it's the math is very complex. It's kind of a madness moment where a crowd is rushing to to an asset and um, difficult to kind of model this but so that's why you, you you find not a whole lot of academic work but there's quite a bit what they find is something like this imagine bitcoin is 
uh, let's say we have an imaginary Bitcoin with no volatility, right? And then from day one, it's set in stone. It's going to grow every year by the same or similar amount uh, with the same pattern, totally predictable. If that happens, if, if today someone gives the world an asset like that, Everyone knows next year it's going to grow by X amount. So what's the logical, what's the logical investment decision for the world? Now you answer that. <clears throat> wait, wait, you uh, come again? Sorry. So imagine we have an asset that it is guaranteed that next year is going to grow by fifty percent. Oh yeah, yeah, of course. Like everyone would uh, flag in, <laughs> and it's kind of it's kind of built in. So. Uh, 8 billion people in the world, they won't have, z- they will have zero uncertainty about its future performance. So they will all jump in. So it will immediately do whatever it was supposed to do next year and the next 10 years in a very short amount of time. So this is why a predictable asset cannot exist in financial markets because if it's predictable, People will just buy it, and then it's not predictable anymore, right? <laughs> so, so this is why you must have volatility in Bitcoin, and this is why Michael Saylor is right when he says volatility is vitality. If anything is supposed to grow, it will definitely be volatile because you just can't control people. As soon as they get more clarity on on growth, they will rush into it, and this causes a ton of growth that should not be happening now but unfortunately it does and then inevitable crash but we will crash to a higher level than before okay now um what happens like the psychology of a bubble like is like this again go back to our boring asset every year is going to grow the same amount Uh, a few people jump in they, they have probably better information than others they or better foresight. They realize that this is a good investment. They come in, bring in their money, and the asset grows. Growth makes more people believe and kind of realize it and take notice, and they will join as well. And this accelerates the prior growth. So now, it, it, it you know rather than growing like a line or something predictable, it now begins growing very fast. The faster it gets the more uninformed participants will realize it. And there's many uninformed, many more uninformed people than informed people, if you haven't noticed. <laughs> so so um, that causes, like the higher the price goes, the bigger the mass of people it attracts, and then the bigger the jump in the number uh, in the price. And it, at that point, it's, it is an exponential growth and it quickly exhausts the potential market's capacity. So it will attract anyone that would be attracted. Like 2017, when the price went from, I don't know, 2000, whatever, 1000 to 20K, at 20K, like the market was exhausted. Every human being that would have been interested in Bitcoin is already aware of it. Otherwise, like people, other people who would, who were living under the rock aside, uh, that's the maximum awareness. Everywhere talk, people talk about it. Same thing in 2021, you know, all, all the news networks, all the pots, all, you know, clubhouse here, everywhere we were, people were talking, talking about it just because the price had gone up. Okay. That's exactly the point where money runs out. So there's no more money. Everyone that was aware is already in. And then the bubble reaches the max. When it reaches there, again, a few early smart people, perhaps hedge funds, perhaps, you know, people with advanced tools, they realize, or sometimes it's just random guess, they realize th- this thing is ending. Like in the last cycle, if you follow grayscale growth, you will exactly see that the inflow of additional money into grayscale ETF, not ETF, the, the what was it called? A trust, I think, uh, stopped right at the top. So the flow of new money, which was arbitraging some TradFi uh, trick, um, stopped at grayscale. 
And so new money stopped. And then little by little, more sophisticated financial players realize that, hey, the game is almost over uh, and they will sell. When they sell, the price at that top drops by one level. Not concerning, nothing, nothing worrisome. But that little drop still causes some other people's stops to be triggered, some more people to get concerned, and that causes more sell sales. That causes more sales and a lot of leveraged players that came in because they were uninformed and they just heard about it last couple of weeks and they wanted to you know, quickly earn a lot of profit. <clears throat> they, they get liquidated. And then uh, the crash accelerates. So a slow crash, a slow correction turns into a significant crash. The, the, remember the guy who was saying Bitcoin is going to do whoosh, go down. And this is, the, this is the mechanics of a bubble. Okay. Now, in the last, sorry for the long answer, but this was an important foundation. Now, in the last few cycles, like since the beginning, this dynamic was created, was kickstarted by the having so when having happened first of all a fundamental shock happened you know, supply went down and that gave us the early growth which will bring in so many other people to to kickstart a significant growth uh, would happen um and then there's also the psychological effect after people saw it one or two times and every time they expect it to happen right now the fundamental effect is gone like the supply impact of uh, another having is negligible compared to all the other things like the ETFs are buying a goddamn, you know, a quarter of a billion a day, right? That's a lot more than another having will do. So it's just not important at all compared to anything else. Even if it accumulates for months and months, not going to be a significant impact. A single billionaire joining the network would have a similar impact. Now, uh, the other thing is psychological. Psych psychology is still strong. People are going to follow this old patterns. So I'm expecting the effect of cycles to kind of weaken a little bit to the extent that that psychology exists. But psychology can change. Like if people only see once that the past cycle pattern has changed, then that's where it stops, right? Then the, the psychological effect also goes away. But my base case is that we're going to still see a lot of cycles, but not following the four-year pattern. We just had a little mini cycle because of ETFs, right? And that was not matching what you would expect from the four-year cycle. Like you don't you don't expect an all-time high before the having. I don't think at least that's uh, anywhere in the historical pattern. Right. So I'm expecting a lot of those things, but because of other reasons, not the having perhaps some nation state adoption or some other geopolitical event that will kickstart a new a new madness phase. It's interesting. One thought I had when you were speaking uh, in, in my head was, could we enrich the, the power law with more data to make it more accurate with, I don't know, with Google's, how many Google searches were made on, on Bitcoin or or what's the sentiment on, on on Twitter or something like that? Like, is 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 that a possibility to to find interesting data points uh, in the history, enrich the the power or further? Yeah, for sure. Um, you can add more components to have better clarity on the four year cycles too. But just as I explained, if you model, um. If you just assume, like naively, that every four year we're going to have this bubble with X percentage, which is like what you see in most Twitter uh, posts about prediction, they just you know, average the last cycles. And uh, well, what if the cycle timing changes, right? That can easily change. So that's not a reliable idea. And that goes back to my early discussion about the cause. The cause is not another four year passing, and the cause is changing. The cause previously was perhaps a, a big psychological and fundamental shock. And if you understand that, you know that, you know, the fundamental part is going away, has gone away. So uh, you, that's not causally explaining the future anymore. So that's that's not a reliable way to model. Now, you can find other variables that have a good explanatory power. For example, if you have, uh, what, I, what I am trying to do right now is, 
use derivatives data to predict these bubbles. Because again, the way I think about a bubble is, is an accelerating madness of the crowd because there is early investors that are entered by analysis and fundamental view. Those are long-term uh, people or perhaps very sophisticated uh, investors. Then we have every other group that comes in just because of the price and they're kind of like an emotional play. You can find these people very well in the derivatives market, um, holding 10x leverage levels. And they are highly levered people, highly emotional, less experienced, and uh, very reactive, <clears throat> right? So you can understand these people's the behavior in those markets. And if you look at the data, you'll see that whenever you have a lot of leverage building up in the derivatives, pretty soon we will have a crash in Bitcoin until all the leverage is cleared up. And whenever derivatives goes really, really short, especially with leverage, uh, Bitcoin pumps significantly. So these people are like the perfect counter signal. And this one is causal. Because you have a great theory why these bad investors should be a counter signal. Because, you know, everyone understands when you have too much leverage built up in a system, it's going to, it's bad. Right? So if Bitcoin is growing up and then you see no additional leverage is built in derivatives, that tells me it's a very, very reliable growth. If it goes up and you see a massive spike in the long, levered long positions in derivatives, you know that this is created by hot money, which will quickly leave at this first sign of trouble, right? The other side of it is true. <clears throat> if it caught, I think, was it last year that we were at 16K um, uh, in the bottom of the last bear market, right? I was very worried about the market like everyone else, particularly because I just had somewhere in my mind that you know below 20K was very difficult. It has never happened and everybody says it's never happened. So I was expecting a lot of like long positions to be there and support the price. But we crashed so hard that even that level was crossed and we went to 16K, okay? Then I looked at the derivatives and with the logic that I explained, I saw massive levels of short positions. And I knew that, you know, um, these people are the best counter signal. So I knew that this is probably the end of it or near the end. You know, perhaps it will go a little bit lower, a little bit higher here and there. But this is the, this is it. I mean, there's just so much uh, short position that can build up in the market. And when you see significant levered short positions, that's the place that, you know, anything else that's left has to be <laughs> has to be moved into Bitcoin, and uh, and sh and that gave me a lot of confidence. You know, it gives you a compass, like I said, right? It gives you some bit understanding is always helpful. It tells you that like if the price is low, it's okay. It's just a temporary panic um, reaction, particularly driven by levered short sellers, right? If you know this, you don't care. You simply wait for these people to get liquidated. Um, now, so if you bring in the derivatives data, you can improve the average that the power law gives and have a better sense of when these bubbles or when these crashes might happen. That's a great insight. I think <clears throat> that's uh, really cool. And now uh, to the thing that I mentioned before that uh, we should also get to uh, is the quality volatility adjusted power law it's an interesting thing i never heard about it uh and when i look at the chart <laughs> i i can make uh, only a little bit out of it so maybe we can uh, i will quickly put it up there and then you can then we can see what what that is do you see it yes uh, it looks good uh, yeah perfect. even better yeah like perfect. we can even get it a little bit bigger even that perfect then um, what, what is the volatility adjusted power law index? What, what, what does this say? Okay. So when you run a regression on a data set, uh, as I said, average actually most of the time doesn't happen. Most of the time data is below or above your average. So 
those deviations, that's what I call deviation, the difference of your value from the regression line uh, can be sometimes positive, can be sometimes negative. And if your regression line is great, you're going to have a more or less equal number of positives and negatives because the line goes through the data. Okay, so um, that model gives you the average. And if you only focus on the deviations, you get the... Um, you get the error error term, or again, what's not modeled by your line, okay? Now, with something like a power law, if we have a model for the average, what we see based on the previous pattern is price can only deviate from the average so much. So if you're too higher than the power law predicted fair value, I'm gonna use the term fair very loosely here, but it's an easy term. So if the price is much higher than the fair value, you expect the price to, to go back down to the fair value. You don't necessarily know exactly when, but you know that's the fair value of the asset. So um, then if the price goes below the fair value, same thing. You see a negative deviation and you expect the, prices to, the price to catch up. Now, in this chart, what I'm doing is only taking the deviations. Deviation is very important because if deviation is too low or too high, that's a great sign of reversal, right? It's kind of like a, a, a spring, you know, if, if you stretch it too long, it's very likely that it's going to rapidly come back. So what you see on this chart um, shows the deviations. And what, what I've uh, what I find is it's not that simple to just get the raw deviation because Bitcoin's behavior changes over time. Like in the past, in the first and second cycle, deviations were significantly larger than the existing deviations uh, in terms of percentage. And that messes up any analysis because you never know how large is too large, right? So I did this thing called volatility adjusting and I looked at the change in nature of Bitcoin from cycle to cycle. And I found a model that gives me a, a, a way to, to capture the changing volatility. And you see that Bitcoin is very volatile in the first cycle, a lot less volatile second cycle, and so on. And if you adjust those deviations by the volatility, instead of it, it, a compressing chart, you see a chart that always peaks uh, and always bottoms near the right place, near the cycle peak and cycle bottom. So um, on this chart, <clears throat> wherever those dots are really red, those are the tops of the, the, the cycle. Wherever they are very dark blue, these are near the bottoms or the light blue near the bottoms of the cycle now this tells me that whenever this index which i call volatility adjusted power law index vpli whenever it is below 20 you know it's the end of it so that's the maximum negative de ne ne that's the maximum deviation below the power law we can get based on history and whenever it is closer to 100 percent, perhaps like above 80 percent tells me that this is now too much deviation to the upside. And at least in the past, every time this has happened, more than 80 and less than 20, we have have had a significant reversal. Does that make sense? And, and where we are, where we are right now, you can see that a few months back when, the, when we were uh, closer to all-time high, early after maybe approval of the ETFs in January and February. Yes, we we reached the point the 50 line. 50 is the fair value that comes from the power law. Anything below 50 means undervalued, anything above 50 means above uh, overvalued. Now, we were kind of fair value and slightly above at once ETFs were approved. ETF spring brought in money, but it more or less stopped it's been a choppy action a few months. And now the power law fair value is growing because as time grows, Bitcoin becomes 
more and more reliable, even if the price doesn't immediately show it. So the power law price grows, but the current actual price has kind of gone down, right? And what I have in the bottom of that chart on left and right, we have the power law predicted price of 75 right now. So, so the fair value is 75, but the market right now is 57. So it's below the fair value. How much below this VPLI index puts it on a nice zero to 100 scale to tell us how big is the deviation. Now, the number I get is 37. Okay, that's kind of halfway from uh, fair value to the absolute bear market bottom, right? So this is, I think, a, this is this is a really good number because we may not necessarily hit, go back to the bottom all the time, every time we are dropping, right? Uh, in an in a in the worst scenario, we will go back down to a VPLI index of twenty, but. You know, we, I, I don't think we are kind of headed for a bear market. So uh, this is one, some of the lowest numbers we're going to see in terms of the VPLI. In other words, the market right now is very cool. And cool is great. The freezing is better, but cool is great. And once it starts a new move, you will quickly see that, okay, first we're going to catch up to the power law price. Perhaps at that point, it's going to be 78 or something like that or 80. And then we're going to go beyond it. Anything beyond the power law price is tells me tells me that we are entering the bubble phase. Now, bubble doesn't mean it's going to burst tomorrow. It, ha it only bursts if it's now, if it grows to an extremely large size. But probability-wise, it makes you more and more worried about a crash, right? So for now, but it's we are on the other side. Cool. Everyone's chill, and I love to see all that negative sentiment on Twitter. People kind of giving up, and that tells me that all those uninformed, levered long people are leaving, and that's the best thing that can happen to the price of Bitcoin. It's also uh, when when we look at the, the the chart and when we look at the history, uh, it's it's likely that we have next year with uh, again such a such a bubble move. It's also interesting how. How high it went to the hundred uh, in in two thousand end of two thousand thirteen uh, it is uh, where those 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 dots are here really interesting to see that we always hit those highs in in uh, end of two thousand thirteen end of two thousand seventeen uh, end of twenty twenty one so like twenty twenty five could again be uh, such a extremely high bubbly year which just means an, an aggressively high price. What, what would you say um, if if we see an, a similar pattern than than the last years, which obviously is not guaranteed, uh, but if we get to like a bubbly state of like eighty or even like eighty five or what it is here, uh, what what would the, the 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 Bitcoin price would then like? What what do you feel like is the is the highest that we 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 should get in the this this Bitcoin price cycle? So from my other analysis, the top of the next. Uh, bubble should be somewhere somewhere around 300k, like 250, 330, that range. But that's the top again, right? Top means it's it's where the bubble will explode. So we may from like we may crash from 300 to 150, right? Uh, so that's important to know. But if you're just looking at the place that we might touch. Uh, we might go as, as high as 250 or 300. Interesting. Uh, really cool. Um, yeah, I, I like I like that uh, chart a lot. It's, it shows a little bit like for someone like me that is just all in, maybe it does not make sense that much. But if you have the decision or the choice like, oh, do a buy now uh, with a lot of money or do a buy maybe in a few months with a lot of money, it can make sense to say like, oh, like we are now in a cool uh, phase. Like it makes sense to buy now instead of waiting now a year. Uh, when we look at all the data, it seems like waiting now one year to buy Bitcoin is a terrible, terrible <laughs> idea. But when you look at 2021 or like 2007 in the top, there you could make an argument around that uh, uh, volatility and the power law uh, index that you're like, oh, uh, if, if, if you can wait and you already have some Bitcoin, uh, you, you can wait with buying a little bit. So like that's, that's let interesting. Me tell you, let me tell you how you can also even benefit from an analysis like this. 
because you know the more convicted you are the more of your wealth is in bitcoin right and at that point if bitcoin crashes from 300 to 150 your wealth is cut by half right i don't think you're gonna just ignore this right um because you know we are in this for the long run we're not necessarily like doing anything crazy but a hundred percent of your wealth cutting in half is noteworthy so if you if you have a tool that will tell you, okay, we just can't, nothing, nothing is broken, right? Nothing is broken. We were just in a bubble phase and this was always bound to happen. So you or you already expect a crash and this doesn't kind of mess with your psychology if that happens, even if you're a long-term investor. It's interesting, yeah? It, it gives even the, the long-term investor a little bit of uh, more conviction and, and insights in that really cool uh you have something else uh like uh let's let's put that up we're already over the one hour but i feel like it's it's uh it's worth getting into uh anyways it's always fascinating how 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 fast the time flies <laughs> uh let me quickly uh pull it up here so we can look at it uh let's paste it in here sorry i think i i went into too much detail on previous ones but i thought the audience might like the more detail. Absolutely. I think uh, it's, it's, it's really great. And I don't like discussions that are shortened just because of time constraints. So I, I like getting uh, deep into stuff, uh, especially if it's interesting. That's why I also don't put any limitations on the, la uh, on the, on the, <laughs> on the time. As I went with Giovanni, I think two and a half hours. Wow. Uh, but usually I try to hit like a one hour mark. So what do we have here? MVRV. Uh, changing market structure and, and range compressions. There are a lot of words that I don't understand. <laughs> yeah, so um, this is a metric that uh, MVRV is a metric that comes from on-chain analysis. And this gives me another way to think about the DGENs and the lever long players. Um, MVRV is short for uh, market value relative to realized value. Uh, you know, when you think about the market cap capitalization of, of Bitcoin, um, there is one market cap, but there is also the real amount of dollars that have been entered to the system and other currencies. So that real realized value is different than the current market cap. Why is that? Because if, you know, if today there is a billionaire that wants to buy Bitcoin, you know, someone goes mad and wants to buy Bitcoin for $1 million a coin. Suddenly the price of Bitcoin goes to 1 million, but that only rep represent the last trade that happened, right? Does that mean everyone else is going to be willing to trade at that price? Of course not, right? But market cap is, is a bad metric because it will just multiply the total. Uh, it will assume that all coins are worth at the latest price, okay? So if suddenly we have a little bit of a sh supply shock on exchanges, the price will shoot up and market cap will show a very high number. But over time, market stabilizes because most other participants are not accepting that price. So it, it goes back down. Um, realized price gives you the exact number of dollars that have entered the system. So essentially this is a validated value somebody was you know exact amount of value has entered the system so there's no error in there <clears throat> now if market cap is much higher than realized value market value much higher than realized value that tells me that uh, a lot of people see great profits in their accounts right the guy brought in 100 dollars, and now the price has gone up so much and now they see 200 dollars uh in their in their portfolio so that means they are sitting on a lot of paper profits okay so mvrv going higher means that the market cap is much higher than the realized value so most people are in profit because you know 100 million dollars entered the, the system but market cap is like way more than that so there's a ton of paper profit in the system but that paper profit is 
again, to, to use the terms loosely, it's all fake because um, not all fake, but more or less it's paper profit, right? It's something people see on the screen. Okay, now if you see that your Bitcoin is up by 2%, you probably won't sell it. If you see that your Bitcoin is up by 300%, there will be a lot of people who will be motivated to take profit. So that is why MVRV can only go up so much. It kind of off behaves like another oscillator when it, it goes too much higher than, uh, than the base it will trigger a lot of sales pressure, sell pressure. Okay. So again, when the total value of an asset is several times bigger than the real dollar that has entered it, that tells me a lot of people are sitting on unrealized profits and this is sell pressure. Now in the beginning, it's, it doesn't create sell pressure because the market is going up and everybody's happy and love loving it. But uh, after a threshold, there is just so much paper profit in the system that we will entice enough people to sell. Like, as you can see in the first cycle, MVRV went from one. One is great. One means, you know, it's the price that you see exactly equal the number of the amount of dollars that entered the system. So there's no risk. It's just, you know, extremely fairly valued. But as the price goes up, um, on average, say it went up all the way to about eight. Eight means market cap was eight times larger than than real dollars that entered Bitcoin. And you can see how that can be a significant problem. Okay. Um, and then at eight, it exploded and went back down to below to one and then below one. Below one means what? Means market cap is below the real dollars that entered the market. So that tells me a lot of people are, are on paper losses. But that one is the absolute minimum that you should expect. Because if market cap is even lower than the real dollar in the system, it's almost guaranteed that it will go back up. So that's like the best bottom indicator that we, we can have and as you can see every time actually it has bottomed uh, in 2012 in 2015 in 2019 and 2023 every time mvrv bottomed it was also the bottom of the cycle and the other way too whenever it topped uh, it was the top of the cycle now the problem is as I said previously, behavior of Bitcoin changes cycle by cycle. So the top uh, was initially in the first cycle at eight. Next cycle, it didn't go to eight. It exploded at six. Maximum was at six. Next cycle, it can't even go beyond five. Okay. Are you following on the chart? Yeah. So next cycle, four. Next cycle, three, right? This is a problem for me because now I don't know next cycle, you know, what would be the max? There's no way you can tell unless you create some crazy connected dots at the top, which is not reliable. Now, um, what I did here was that I try to explain what's going on. Why is this compression happening? The bottoms are going up, the tops are going down, and the graph is getting compressed. And then I thought, okay, this is actually representing the volatility of Bitcoin because volatility is going down. As the asset gets bigger, you get less and less crazy moves. It's much harder to have the market cap deviate from realized cap as the asset is bigger and more liquid and global, right? So then I thought, okay, if we can find a measure of volatility and correct this chart by that volatility metric, it should help. And that's exactly what I did. If you go to the next chart, I have a volatility measure. This is my model of volatility. Uh, the height of this chart is the measure of volatility. And you can see that it goes up and down in every cycle because it's a lot more volatile at near the top, a lot less volatile at the bear market's bottom, but overall the volatility is going down. And if I use that model to correct the previous chart, if you go to the next chart, you get a volatility adjusted MVRV. 
or yeah, we summarize it MVRV. And it's striking that once you do that, all the tops align and all the bottoms align. Okay, so that gives me, whenever this metric goes to 100, that gives me a great indicator that uh, market cap is too much bigger than the realized cap. So massive risk of uh, bubble bursting. And then when it goes closer to zero, that means market cap is way below the realized cap, that it's now unsustainable and, and we should come back up. So um, these actually help a lot because, you know, it turns into a very good metric that was not actionable to an actionable metric. So that's that's the summary of the VMVRB. That's all really interesting. Like, I like that we kind of collected in that episode now so many indicators uh, that are all are indicators of like, where are we right now in the Bitcoin cycle? And from that is kind of like where we are likely to go uh, within the next couple months, years, uh, whatever. Um, and uh, and I like that kind of knowledge because in financial terms, even as you said, even if you're 100% in Bitcoin, you still benefit from knowing directionally where the market is going, like not trade on it, not like day trade or hourly trade on, on anything like that. It's it's like, uh, it's it's not a good model for that. Uh, but know the directional thing. If you have a big purchase in, in, in one year, uh, you can um, way better calculate things and way better see things where where people, where things can, could go. I, I like that a lot, that the kind of certainty that, that gives you that. Um, but just not bet your life on it, <laughs> don't bet anything uh, meaningful in it. it. Just like try to look at it as a uh, financial indicator that help you to make an informed decision. That, that's what I get as a summary from that. that yes, good? yeah, exactly. I, I, like, I like the way you put it. Um, if a model is done right, it works only as long as the pro historical pattern continues, right? Um, you don't have, like I said, a whole, we don't have a whole lot of reasons that Bitcoin will suddenly change its behavior, but it's not impossible. Just understand that, you know, Bitcoin can change its behavior a little bit, but a massive giant ship is not going to just go suddenly change direction. It may happen slowly, but you have to be ready also to accept that reality. Was the power law updated uh, in the last couple years, uh, uh, or uh, will it be? Or what, what would it like? What would need to happen to like say that like oh we sh we should adjust it or like we should we we have to update it in in some sense? Uh, like I said, one of the first tests I ran on on this before I even get in kind of interested, I I looked at the power law that you would have gotten in twenty sixteen, and it still works. Uh, pretty well, like very, very well. Like if you extrapolate eight years into the future and you're only wrong by like $10,000, $20,000, I'll, I'll take it. So, <laughs> um, so there's no reason to change at this point. And unlike some people say, the parameters should not change, right? Parameters are the same. The model that you create today should continue to work in future. But as I said, if the ship is changing direction, um, perhaps in a few years, we will see that maybe there was a little, you know, improvement that you could do to make it even more accurate. But um, at that point, you still have to run all these tests again and make sure that you kind of optimize the model with the new data. New data should always change your model a little bit, not a whole lot. If um there's another you know scam you can run is to come up with an overfitting model and every year it's going to predict incorrectly and then you change the parameters and now it's correct predicting correctly again every year you do that and that gives you you know a perpetually correct model right so that's not the way you do it really, uh, uh, yeah. really cool uh as uh, we are progressing the time a lot, uh, and I want to also be respectful to your time, um, we come now to the end routine. I think uh, 
most definitely I want to do a, a second round in like half a year or a year with you. I think that there are a lot of uh, interesting avenues we can uh, build on that episode to to go further into something. And uh, I'm really looking forward to, because I just started a po- podcast like nine months ago, I'm really looking forward to those second and third rounds with guests because then we can actually build on an episode uh, and can go further into stuff. Um, the, the question that I always ask be, uh, before the actual end routine uh, is always the same question for every guest. What can we learn from you besides Bitcoin, besides the power or besides all the things that we already talked about on the podcast? Economics. Um, cause I, I'm, I'm a business professor and, um, I teach a lot of business concepts plus a lot of economics. So, um, even though a lot of my audience still likes direct Bitcoin concepts, but I think understanding economics is not even an option. It's a must for everyone, at least at the basics, to uh, have a better life. And they will, and on not understanding economics is going to have devastating consequences. Like many nations that switched to poverty from wealth because they they changed their system into a uh, say, for example, Venezuela, right? They were one of the richest countries a few decades back. They thought, hey, let's try this thing, socialism. How bad could it be? And most people and politicians in that country didn't really understand economics in terms of, you know, what is the engine of wealth creation? And that the result is now the whole country is in, you know, hyperinflation, significant poverty is something like 70 to 80% of the people are now in living in extreme poverty. Uh, how can you make such a mistake? Not understanding economics. Do you see also um, the the Western world or like America? I don't know where you're from, uh, but the Western world, Europe, uh, going down this path slowly? Unfortunately, yes, because... Um, lack of under again, lack of understanding of economics plus the appeal of socialism. Socialism is, you know, following a noble goal, like equality. I don't even think it's, it's needed, like, but it's, it's kind of, for some reason, it's appealing. Like you like, I, even if I like see someone that has a lot less wealth than I have, I feel a little bit unhappy about this, right? So I don't know, there's something in our nature that wants people to be doesn't like that gap, right? So that is the engine that uh, bad economics is built on, right? A lot of the people who play on people's emotions, they will make you think that uh, if you do this and that, the poor will be happier. And that brings in a lot of smart people for the ride because you know like i said we're all humans we all have emotions and we all love to see other fellow human beings succeed and and not be poor that's what most people genuinely love to see in other people like no one likes to see other people being poor right um but if you choose the wrong solution the only thing you'll do is to make poor people even worse off and maybe everyone now will be poor. So it's important that the goal is good. The tool is destructive. And that's unfortunately what most people don't understand. And especially in wealthier nations, you know, the guy has benefited for years from the wealth creation engine that was available in these countries. Now they're feeling really comfortable. And now they're thinking, okay, what if we kill this wealth creation engine and see if it helps? Yeah, there's a popular saying in, in German, if you are a socialist, uh, un, if, if you are the socialist under uh, 20, you don't have a heart. Uh, but if you're still a socialist over 20, you're an I- idiot. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. You guys understand it. That's great. I'm going to use that a lot. <laughs> I, 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 lo- I love that a lot. Like it's, 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 it really captures it because the intentions, like the, the naivety of, of, of just being a socialist is like, yeah, you, you want that everyone is great, but then reality ca- kicks in and you're like, yeah, like a free market, a capitalistic system. Yeah. This actually works. And uh, this actually incentivizes people to work hard and people working hard brings humanity forward. So like all, all those things that is, is uh, easy f- to understand if you understand economics, but yeah, if you're under 20, it's understandable. 
that uh, you have a, maybe a different view or like under 25, whatever the, the number is. So I think that that captures it really cool. <laughs> Perfect. And uh, thank you so much. We have an endotine uh, where the previous guest is asking a question for the next guest without knowing who the next guest actually is. And the question is interesting. I could have even asked it <laughs> before I asked, uh, asked the parlor. But the question for you is, how can we transition peacefully to a hyper-Bitcoinization? I think uh, there's. N I don't see it as a transition necessarily. I see it as a long-term process. And this is already happening. Like, Four years ago, like how many things were extremely crazy, unlikely, and we would brand it as like lunatics for even entertaining those possibilities, like a whole nation state adopting the magic internet money, BlackRock becoming a defender and supporter of Bitcoin with billions of dollars, presidential candidates fighting over it. It's just, it's endless. Like it's orders of magnitude uh more positive news right now that was like extremely crazy so i just don't see any problem but i don't see any like any step change if in a few years we get similar orders of magnitude changes um, suddenly a few nations are fighting over capturing more and more of the mining you know oil producing countries exporting their oil to the bitcoin network through through massive mining operations um apple building bitcoin payments into their device and suddenly bitcoin becoming a global payment uh, global e globally accessible and super easy to use payment mechanism where all the other retailers now easily can accept it that's possible like it's, it's all part of the same path it's not like a significant deviation it's all happening and the engine of this is government irresponsibility like i would say the only reason that bitcoin may not succeed is if government suddenly becomes very responsible which uh, i think it's a good bet to take the other side off absolutely i i, I like to take that bet every every day and even like if, even if you're on the wrong side of that bet like then we have a responsible government. That's good. <laughs> like, that, yeah. like even if the, it doesn't happen. Really cool. Thank you so much, Sinan, uh, for being on the show. Uh, before I let you go, where can people reach out to you, ask you questions, read your stuff? Where can people find you? Yeah, so uh, I'm a co-founder of 21st Capital. We provide consulting. Uh, what is it? Cons what is it consulting about? Any question about Bitcoin? So we we even do like educational courses, like if. Uh, we have a few clients that wanted us to create custom courses, teach us about Bitcoin. We do that. Or if you want us to tell you about custody, or if you want us to hold your hand, helping you move your money from exchange to a hardware wallet, create a single SIG, multi SIG, uh, collaborative custody, and uh, anything else, we are here to help Bitcoiners become better, smarter, more effective, safer, more secure Bitcoiners, um, legacy planning, uh, things like that. I'm also very active on Twitter posting analytics. Uh, we also provide analytics services if you're interested. But uh, right now, most of my work is on Twitter. And uh, just follow me on Cena underline 21st. Um, and uh, I try to stay to the point and mostly talk about anything data, anything Bitcoin and data. And uh, yeah, uh, I guess just our website and our and my twitter perfect yeah by the way we even had uh Ruspe, uh on, on the on the podcast he was one of my few podcast guests that were actually in person in the, in, the, in the podcast studio uh which is just that but i have two chairs here <laughs> instead of just mine uh so uh, that that was a great episode i, I loved it uh and i, I will just for the listeners and, and watchers, I, I work on having more and more people in person, but it's like a, it's a, it's, it's a headache with putting like an in-person studio together and everything like that. But there will come more and more in Vienna in-person podcast uh, with the people that are willing to come to me and visit me and, and have a podcast in person. Maybe we can do the second round if, if you're interested in, in Vienna also would, would love that. Perfect. Then uh, let's come. Lovely. Uh, that would be a lovely travel and lovely talk. So. Who knows? Maybe, maybe we'll do it. <laughs> let, let, let's see. On an all-time high in 2020, 
five <laughs> to, to, to talk about when the next <laughs> bubble bursts. <laughs> yeah, I'll drive to you with my Lambo or maybe private jet. <laughs> let, 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 let's do it like that. Perfect. And thank you so much, Tina, for, for taking your time. Also, thank you so much for everyone that is watching and listening. As always, I'll be back tomorrow with another episode. Bye-bye. Thank you.